this evening. I'm going to continue through the book of James. We're almost done. Um, I was going to finish up tonight, but that would have been too easy. So I'm going to finish up next Sunday night instead. Um, but I think the Lord has a, has a good word for us this evening. But before we get started, let's pray one more time together. <clears throat> Father, I just pray tonight you'd help us again, Lord, hear from your servant James. Pray that we would hear God, believe, trust, obey. All that you have written, God, you are for us in Jesus Christ. You're not against us. And Lord, just pray you'd grant us the grace and the strength to... Just lay all that we are before you for that everlasting joy and prize. Thank you for tonight. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And as you do, I just want to ask you a few questions. Now, you don't have to answer out loud. <laughs> do you pray? Do you believe God answers prayer? Do you think the answer to the second question affects the answer to the first question? Think about it. Can you believe that through Jesus Christ, we have direct access to God the Father? And that... If we are in Christ, as surely as God declared there at the Jordan River, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased in the same way. If we are in Christ, that's how God looks at us. Those of you who have children, your children come and they ask for things. <laughs> and sometimes you'll say no. But many times you'll say yes. Why? Because they're your child. And you love them. And I think maybe sometimes we forget how willing God is to answer, to answer our prayers. And that's why we don't pray. Because we think it won't make a difference. When in Christ we are the children of God. And so tonight we're going to talk about prayer um, <clears throat> and a few different things about it. Uh, so, so that's where we're headed this evening. So now let's turn to our text. And if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. From James chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. <coughs> verse 12. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. <coughs> then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. The word of God, you may be seated. We'll see three things from our text this evening. Number one, let your words to men be true. Number two, let your prayers to God be persistent. And number three, let your prayers to God be your power. 
So again, let your words to men be true. Let your prayers to God be persistent. And let your prayers to God be your power. First, number one, let your words to men be true. <coughs> so verse 12 there that we read is about oaths. And uh, it's kind of hard to know where to fit that in with the rest of what James is saying. So I'm going to put it in here before we begin our discussion of prayer. He says, above all, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or any other oath, but let your yes be yes and yet let your no be no, that you may not fall under condemnation. Um, James says above all here, um, it's not clear whether he intends to say that it's the most important thing that he's saying. Some commentators suggest that it's just, um, it's just a way to indicate he's approaching the end of his letter. But regardless, this is an important teaching that reflects Jesus' own teaching in Matthew chapter 5. He says again, you have, heard it, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So to understand what's going on here, in Jesus' day, the, the religious leaders had developed a rather elaborate system of taking oaths. And depending on what it was that you swore by, um, that, that determined how binding, if you will, your oath was. And so, you know, it says not to take the name of the Lord in vain. So they were careful not to swear by God's name in most cases, but they might swear by other things. I swear by Jerusalem. I swear by heaven. I swear by the hairs on my head. You know, you ever heard people talk like that? <coughs> so they're swearing by all these different things. But, in, but what might happen is later down the road, based on what, the, what it is they swore by, they may say, well, you know, I only swore by this. You know, it's, and, and in other words, they are strategically using certain terms or phrases so that they could get out of their word later. In other words, they obscured their language rather than being straightforward and saying just yes or no and letting that be it. They obscured their language even to the point to where they might be meaning, they might, they might be saying one thing, but really they're meaning another. They're being duplicitous with their words, to a, a double-tongued. James and Jesus flat out condemn this. And we as Christians have the responsibility to have integrity with our words. It's very easy to mislead someone. It happens all the time. It's very easy to give somebody the impression that is contrary to what you actually mean or what you actually think. It's, it's very easy to deceive someone. And we as Christians are to be people of utmost integrity. And this should especially be true in our words. Since we serve a God who never lies, we too must be above, our pro, above reproach in the language that we use. And increasingly, the world that we live in <coughs> doesn't have a problem with this. But it cannot be so within the church of God. We have to say what we mean and mean what we say. We have to be, we have to be honest in our dealings and in our interactions with other people and not be misleading. And this can be, and sometimes we do this and we, we justify it, you know, we justify it with, uh, with different reasons. You know, well, I, I just don't want to hurt their feelings. Well, just because you don't want to hurt your feelings doesn't mean you should lie or deceive or be duplicitous in what you say. <laughs> let your yes be yes and let your no be no. We'll say small fibs or white lies for the greater good. You know, there was a season <coughs> in Southern Baptist history where uh, the professors uh, in the seminaries were teaching things that the average person in the pew would, 
would be shocked to believe that the seminaries were teaching. But when they were questioned on it, they would say, well, I believe this. And they would say things like, I believe the Bible is inspired. But they would know that their definition of inspired is different than yours. But they wouldn't tell you that. They wouldn't make it clear. It's easy to deceive. And we as Christians must be people of integrity known <coughs> for our truth telling. We should be people where pe people should come to us expecting us saying, I'm going to go to them because I know they're going to tell me the truth. Or our friend whom we've prayed for who his family got attacked and he had to go back to his home country. One of the stories I was told is that where he lives, the Christians have, a, have an incredible reputation for integrity. People, if, if, the, if the Christian goes to somebody and says, I want to borrow money, they ask no questions. Because why? Because they know they're good for it. Are you known for being good for your word? We as followers of Christ must be people of integrity in, in a world that increasingly uses words to manipulate and to deceive and to, and to pursue an agenda at the cost of others, being true to our words is going to become an increasingly powerful testimony. When we become known as tellers of the truth, people who exercise integrity with our words. So number one, let your words to men be true. Number two, let your prayers to God be persistent. Look again in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? <coughs> let him call to the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And so here James kind of uh, begins talking about prayer. And there's really just a very loose connection, if one at all, between this and the previous passage, as is common in James. But one has to do with the spirit of our words towards men, and this latter one has to do with the spirit of our words towards God. And I ask the question as I read this, why is, why is James telling us this? Why is James phrasing it this way? And it seems to me that the answer is that he wants us to be persistent in prayer. He opens up with these two questions. Is anyone suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So he's got two totally different experiences in the life of a believer. One person is undergoing hardship. Another person is, is cheerful at this time of life. Things seem to be going well for them. And what, what James is saying is that regardless of your circumstances, the proper response is to pray. If things are not quite like you would wish them to be, pray. If things are going great, praise, which is what? Praise is just a certain type of prayer to God. It's lifting up your voice to God and giving him praise and thanksgiving. Whatever your circumstances, whatever your situation, turn to God. <coughs> we must learn to be a praying people. We must learn to be quick to go to God in prayer. When you have that inkling of the Holy Spirit that you need to stop and pray, then stop and pray. And not only be led by the Spirit, but we must be intentional, habitual in our, in our praying. We cannot, we should make it our business since we believe that we are the children of the Most High God and that He is for us because we belong to His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, then we should be a praying people because we know that we call out to omnipotent God who has the power to make a difference in our lives and the lives of others. And so we should let no sinner go unprayed for. We should let no good gift of God go unthanked. You see, everyone in our life, every, every one of us, we settle into habits and into routines. And so as your pastor, I challenge you to make prayer a habitual part of your life. Don't say you can't do it because <laughs> you can. We all have habits. Sometimes it's getting home from work and flipping on the TV. You do it every day without fail. 
What if before you turned on the TV, you went to God and made that a habit? Made it a habitual part of your life. You say, I don't even have to think about it. I know that when this time comes, I'm going to God. We can do that. We can build this into our lives. Let us go to God before we go to our TVs. Let us go to God before we go to work. Let us go to Christ before we go anywhere else. And say, Lord, teach us to pray. That's what the disciples, you know, if you don't know what else to pray, then pray that. God, teach me to pray. Teach me how to pray. Help me believe, God, that you hear and answer. And he will. And the more that we fellowship with God, you know, I fear sometimes, this is totally off topic, but I fear that sometimes there are Christians who don't want Jesus to come back. I really believe that. They're scared when they think about it. And the reason I think it's so is because they feel like they don't know him. Why? Because they never talk to him. When you talk to someone, you get to know them. And when you get to know someone and you love them, then you want to see them. And if Jesus feels like a stranger to you, then maybe it's time to begin the conversation. And getting alone in your room and saying, Jesus, I want to know you. And it's a conversation that you cry out to God and Jesus speaks to you. And he speaks to you primarily through this book. And so through prayer and through Bible study, we have a conversation with God Almighty. Let us go to God. Make plans. If you don't make plans, make plans right now and saying, this is how I'm going to incorporate prayer into my life. If you don't make plans, it'll never happen. Lord, teach us to pray. And then James goes further and addresses a particular type of suffering worth praying for, (coughs) which is sickness. And it's good to pray for sickness. And we are instructed, James says, to call for the elders of the church. And I'll, I'll, I'll preach a sermon on this, Lord willing, soon. But the elder, I think there's a good biblical case that can be made that elder, is, the terms elder, overseer, and pastor are used more or less interchangeably in the New Testament. It's the same office. And as a side note, everywhere elders are mentioned, it's always in the plural. That's why I think it's, it's, it's always helpful and biblical even to have multiple people, even if they're not paid staff, multiple people that meet the qualification of elder bearing the shepherding responsibility of the church. Why? Because it's too much for one man. I'm telling you, it's too much. But he says to call to the elders of the church. And uh, it may be here that uh, calling them to come could specifically mean that they're just too sick to get out of bed. And and it says anoint them with oil. And maybe you've wondered about that. And commentators are all over the place about it. But I think what it is, is that it's not magical, you know. It's not, and I, nor do I think it's medicinal. Rather, I think it's a sign that the person is being set apart in a unique way into the care and into the power of God. Anointing in the Old Testament had to do with setting a person apart for a purpose. Kings were anointed. David would not lay a hand against Saul, even though Saul was trying to kill him because he was God's anointed. He had been set apart by God for a specific purpose and the same with the prophets. And it seems to me that this anointing, this person says, we are setting you apart in a a specific power, in a specific way through this sign of anointing. We're setting you apart in a unique and powerful way into the healing hand and power of God. And Baptists are kind of squeamish about this. I don't want anyone rubbing my head with oil. But it's in the book. So if you called me and said, Pastor Chad, I want you to anoint me with oil and pray over me, I'm going to say, okay, let's do it. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to think twice about it. I got, some, I, got a, I got a jar of olive oil at the house. I'll bring it. 
And we'll anoint you and get you prayed over and entrust you to the hand of Almighty God who can heal and who can change and who can make a difference in our lives. Second thing, it says, call. (coughs) He says, let him call the elders of the church. There's a biblical command to call your pastor. (laughs) Right? It's right there. Call him. It's okay. You can call me if there's some kind of need and tell me that you want prayer and I will pray with you. Because God hears prayer and we can pray. And I just, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Don't suffer alone. That's one of the most basic takeaways of this passage. Ask for help. Call on other believers. You know, we we have friends and we have family, but sometimes our friends and family, you know, aren't walking with the Lord. What we if we are a follower of Christ, we need spiritual family to come inside of us and call on God with us. To help us in our time of need. Don't suffer alone. And then James says the the prayer of faith will save them, and if they've sinned, they will be forgiven. So there's a, there's a couple of things you should probably comment on there. First, he says the, the, the prayer of faith will, <coughs> will save him. Now, that, it's, that's a big theological issue there, the relationship between prayer and God's sovereignty and healing and faith, etc. But we do know that there is a correlation in the Bible between uh, faith and healing. And when, God, when Jesus healed people, there were times when it explicitly says things like, you know, seeing he had faith, he healed him. And in fact, in Matthew 13, 58, in his, in his own hometown, it says he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And so in other words, we can't, we can't expect God to do anything if we don't believe in him, that he is able, that he is willing, that he is for us in Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, Paul would say everything that does not proceed from faith is sin. So, of course, we have to pray in faith. But I, at the same time, I think it would be wrong to say, as some people have said, that if someone isn't healed, it's because they didn't have enough faith. I've heard just terrible stories of people telling other people that if you would just believe more, God would heal you. Never tell anybody that. God is not a genie that if we just rub the lamp the right way, he's going to give us our wishes. He's not something to manipulate. God has a will, and so we must pray, as in the book of John, it says, pray according to the will of God. The apostle Paul likely suffered for some physical issue that he prayed three times for God to heal, and God wouldn't take it away. So there is so we must have faith when we pray and we should pray in faith. But I don't think I think it'd be incorrect here to interpret James as giving some blanket promise that will always be healed. And then what about the next part where James says and if he has committed sins he will be forgiven. This is interesting. The most important part of that phrase there in verse 15 or the, is the word, if, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The if is important. That means that there is indeed a connection between sickness and sin. But it's not a guaranteed connection. Now, in one sense, sickness exists because sin exists. Right? The day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. In other words, death exists because sin exists. Death, disease, decay, pain, sorrow, brokenness entered into the world because disorder entered into the world through sin. Because sin is the ultimate form of disorder. It's rebellion against God Almighty. And so the Bible does clearly link sickness and death with sin. But we know at the same time that 
that no specific illness can be linked absolutely to a specific sin. Unless it's some kind of disease transmitted that way, of course. But, but in, from a theological perspective, we can't link the two. In other words, what I'm saying is if you get a cold, you can't say, oh my gosh, that's because I lied to the so-and-so last week. You can, there, there, we can't make that direct connection. How do we know that? Because of the book of Job, Job lost everything and he got terribly sick and all his friends came to him like good friends do and say, what did you do to make God this mad at you? And he said, I didn't do anything. And God, in the end, did in fact vindicate him. He hadn't done, it wasn't because of his sin that God calls him to do that, but for God's own sovereign purposes. But at the same time, there are some times in which the Bible does say that sickness can be linked to sin. For example, 1 Corinthians 11, we read at the Lord's Supper, let a person examine himself, then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. So there is a sin, there, is, there are cases in which sin is linked to sickness and to illness. And so what do we do? Well, <laughs> it's actually quite simple. If there's sin in your life, confess it and repent. And then you don't have to be concerned whether something happening to you is a result of sin or not. And if, and if something, and if you're going through a difficult time in life, I would be very slow to assume that it has something to do with sin. I would be very slow to assume that. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you know it, God is not out to get you. I feel like some people, they live like that. They feel like God's constantly out to get them. If you belong to Jesus, God's not out to get you. He loves you. Now, the Bible does teach that God disciplines his children because every child who loves, every parent who loves his children disciplines them. So, yes, God can discipline us, but he's never punishing us. He's never hurting us. And, you, and, it's, and because of our limited knowledge, we can never draw a direct line from our sin to some kind of problem in our lives. But at the same time, if, we, if there is problems in our lives and if there is sin in our lives, I, as your pastor, would say, I, I won't tell you for sure, but it might be God trying to tell you, wake up. Wake up. Turn, confess your sin. Repent of it. Come back to God. And know that he is for you and not against you if you're in Jesus Christ. So, let your words to men be true. Let your prayers to God be persistent. And finally, <coughs> let your prayers to God be your power. Let your prayers to God be your power. Verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great powers that is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain. And the earth bore its fruit. So, James here concludes his, his little section on prayer by referencing the power and the privilege that we have on calling on God in prayer. The proper human response in every situation is to turn to God in prayer because he is for us in Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Let's be a praying people. I was thinking about this week. How many things do we complain about that we don't pray about? What if we made it a spiritual law in our lives that we would refuse to complain about something until we've prayed for it? And chances are, if you pray for it, you'll no longer want to complain about it because you've given it to God. James says, you do not have because you do not ask. We all have problems. And what do we do? 
how do we deal with our problems? James says the only appropriate way to deal with our problems is to take them to God. And not just to God, but to one another. And that's what it says in verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Now, this is fascinating here because James says that it's not, he implies here that it's not just enough to confess your sins to God. He says, confess your sins to one another. That's what it says. If we have sinned against other people, then of course we just don't need to just ask God for forgiveness. We have to ask them for forgiveness. We have to confess that sin to them and repent and do whatever it takes to make it right. Why? So that you may be healed. There is a healing. There is a healing that can only take place when you confess your sins to other people. There is a healing that can only take place when you're no longer in the darkness. When you're no longer anonymous. When somebody else finally knows what's going on in our lives. And I've said before that we have a serious problem in Southern church Bible Belt culture because we're, for some reason, we're terrified to people, for other people to know that we have problems. How do I know that? Because when I knock on a door, I can hear someone scurrying to pick up around the house because God forbid they find, I find out that their house isn't spotless 24-7. If they don't want me to know that their house is dirty sometimes, are they going to actually tell me real problems in their life? So what do we do? We suffer in darkness, being strangled to death by our sin, and nobody knows. It is in the darkness that sin thrives, and it is when nobody knows that nobody can help you. You know what I call that? I call it right where the devil wants you. And the sin in your own heart and the devil will tell you all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't make it known. Why you shouldn't tell other people. Why you shouldn't invite other people into your pain who love you and who care about you and who want to help you and bring them in so that we can bear this burden with you so that you're not just crushed by it. The one way to make sure that sin has free reign to wreak havoc in your life is to tell nobody about it. But there is power. That's what it says. What does it say? So that you may be healed. If you have ever struggled with any kind of sin before that you know you need to confess and you actually went to somebody and confessed it, if you know that feeling, you know what I'm talking about. There's freedom. Why? Because somebody finally knows. Because finally I'm not alone. Because finally, this guilt of weighing on me, feeling like, feeling like nobody knows, feeling like I'm a, I'm a hypocrite. Finally, I'm known. And it's only then that healing and restoration can take place. That's why we exist. That's why the church of God exists. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. That's why we exist. It's again, as I've said, it's a great irony that that the church would be the place where people are most reticent to confess their sins when we're the only place with a solution for your sin. When we're the only place where our hearts have been ravished by the love of God, where we know the battle and the struggle and the temptation of sin just as much as you do. And we know the grace of God and his power to forgive and to deliver and to to help and to save. Sin is a terrible thing. But repented sin, confessed sin, forsaken sin, forgiven sin. 
Oh, there's nothing like it. Finally, James here references Elijah. And his point is this. It's not that Elijah was some spectacular guy, although you read, the, you read Elijah and you think he was, but his point is actually the opposite. He says Elijah was just like us. You know, he called down fire on Mount Carmel, and then literally, immediately, he runs from Jezebel because she's going to kill him. He's just like us. He's fickle. He goes up to Mount Sinai and hides in a cave and throws a pity party for himself till God shows up and whispers to him. Elisha was a man just like us, but he prayed. That's the difference. He prayed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power that it's working. And that righteous person there, it doesn't mean that he was an exceptional person. <coughs> the Bible says that Jesus, he became sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a righteous person. You, you meet this category of a person whose prayer is powerful as it is working. And so what do we do? Oh, church, we must pray. We must pray. What's going on in your life? What struggles are you facing? What thing are you just feel like you're beating your head against the wall and there's no breakthrough? What person have you been trying to point to Jesus Christ and been praying for for a long time and nothing seems to happen? Take it to God. Take it to Him. Don't give up. But what's more than that? What's more than that? Take it to others. Let us join you in your praying. Let us join you in your struggles, in your burden. Let us walk into the light together. And James says, we will be healed. And if you don't know the healing forgiving, saving, life-changing power of Jesus Christ this evening. I pray you would know it. You don't know until you know it. You haven't tasted it till you've tasted it. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. You'll never be the same. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. 